Good evening, and welcome to the Evening at Egan Lecture Series. My name is Angie Steves, and I work at the Chancellor's Office. The annual fall lecture series is free to the general public and live streamed throughout Southeast on youtube.com forward slash UA Southeast. There are two ways that you can help support this event. One is by joining the UAS alumni and friends, friends of the Egan Library, and make a gift to the new UA, excuse me, UASAA, Friends of the Egan Library, Evening at Egan Fund, which you are working to endow to support this event. Membership and gift cards are in each row. You can find them, and there's um, pens and envelopes in the back for your use. You can find more information online at www.uas.alaska.edu forward slash Egan Lecture. A few housekeeping uh, items before we begin. Bathrooms are located in the back and upstairs by the front desk. Emergency exits are also in the back there and over here in the end, end of this room. Please remember to turn off your phones, silence your phones, and there will be time at the end of the presentation for questions. Please use the mic and I will hand it to you and come up here in the aisle area to uh, make your, make your question, say your questions so our online people can, can hear them. And now please help me, join me in welcoming Chancellor Karen Carey. Thank you, Angie. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Carey, and I am the chancellor here at UAS. And before we get started, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Our campus resides on the unceded territory of the Akwan and Lincoln Ani, also known as Juneau Douglas, Alaska. We acknowledge that Klink peoples have been stewards of the land on which we work and reside since time immemorial, and we are grateful for that stewardship and incredible care. We also recognize that our campus is adjacent to the ancestral home of the Takakwan and houses neighboring Haida and Shimshian peoples. We commit, we commit to serving these peoples with equity and care. We recognize a series of unjust actions that attempted to remove the Akwan from their land, which includes forced relocation and the burning of villages. We honor the relationship that exists between the Klinkit, the Haidas, and the Shimshian peoples and their sovereign relationships to their lands, their languages, and their ancestors, as well as future generations. We aspire to work toward healing and liberation, recognizing our paths are intertwined to the complex histories of colonization in Alaska. We acknowledge that we arrived here by listening to the people's elders' lessons from the past, and these stories carry us as we weave a healthier world for future generations. And at this time, I would like to introduce Karen Silkaitis, who is going to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you. Wasa ieti yak e ichwasatini. The late Khahinach Karen Yuchatduasak. Um, I'm currently taking my first beginning Tlingit class here at UAS, which you can take for free for the non-credited sections, which I'm really enjoying right now. It's really good to see you. And what I said was, hello, welcome. It's good to see you this evening. And my English name is Karen. So my name is Karen Sokaitis, and I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences at UAS. I am in my uh, second year here. I arrived last July to this wonderful place and this wonderful campus. And I'm really thrilled to uh, introduce this incredible speaker and be here tonight with you at Evening at Egan. So this lecture 
is the first in a series of three lectures that is going to happen statewide. Um, and I want to get the other two right so that you can maybe tune into those as well. So we're calling this series of three lectures the Just and Regenerative Business in Alaska. And the next one is going to take place at the University of Alaska Fairbanks on March 2nd. And that's going to be their One Health Global Impact Coordination and Collaboration Lecture. And then we're going to have one later in the spring at kind of a TBA date. We're still figuring that one out at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And that one's going to be on sustainability in business and economics. All three of these um, talks were made possible by a private donor um, who created the Educational Legacy Fund with the UA Foundation. And when all of us got together in a Zoom room last year, actually, is when the conversation started, and we decided that we were going to do these speaker series at the three universities, I volunteered to go first. And I was the newest one, right? And they said, you do? And I said, yeah, yeah, I want to go first because it's the just and regenerative business uh, you know, in Alaska, and I know exactly who I want to bring here. And her name is Alexis Bunton. And I popped Alexis's bio into the chat. And everybody went, oh. And I said, yeah. Because I met Alexis at the tourism conference in Sitka. And I got to hear Alexis speak. And I was so blown away by her passion and her words. And at the time, I was thinking about and brainstorming and having initial conversations with faculty here at UAS about this amazing place that I was falling deeply in love with called Juneau, Alaska. And I was like, wow, this place has so much possibility and this institution's incredible. We have so much possibility here and I'm, you know, I'm still in this deeply in love place. And I was thinking, tourism is so important to this community and what could we do here at the university involving tourism and at the time I was thinking about these words called eco and sustainable and then I got to hear Alexis speak about the word regenerative and I thought well, why would be why would we just I think settle with the word sustainable uh, which implies to me the status quo when we could be regenerative and uh, I got really excited by everything that Alexis had to say. I immediately knew that she had to come here to UAS. So it's my pleasure to introduce her to you. So Alexis uh, has researched and worked in native-led tourism since 1997. She's coming to us tonight from her home in Monterey, but she hails from Alaska. She's lived in Juneau. She's lived in Sitka. You're going to hear a lot about her history. She owns a company. Well, she works in a well, this is where a lot of hats, but we're going to talk about one particular company tonight called Waka LLC, which is dedicated to forwarding transformational travel through cross-cultural experiences. Alexis has taught for a lot of universities, uh, UCLA, Humboldt State, Victoria, University of Victoria. Um, she's held a bunch of postdocs. She's a four-time author. I think she's brought her books here tonight, so I'll let Alexis tell you more about her published texts. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it there and bring up Alexis. And thank you for joining us. And please give Alexis a warm welcome. Right. Well, thank you, Karen. I hope I can live up to the hype. You're a good hype woman. Um, so yes, I do want to thank you t for inviting me in tonight, and I'm really excited to be giving this talk because, as Dean Silkaida said, I have been—I can't believe it—but I've been working in tourism for 25 years, and I started right here in Juneau, um, actually doing undergraduate research. I was going to college in the East Coast, and I had an opportunity to do research for an undergraduate thesis, and I was really homesick for here, and I loved. Northwest Coast Art, so I cooked up an idea to study mm -hmm. contemporary Northwest Coast Art, and I was really curious about the issues that artists face in this art form, and of course that has everything to do with the impact of tourism on culture and culture change, so that's where I got my start, and I am full circle back here now. So this is not my computer, so I might have to scrap my notes, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so um, right now, um, as Dean Silkaitis said, oh, oh, I got a, fr I got a friend here. <laughs> it is, I'm just wondering, do I just do that? Mm -hmm. 
can I can I take this and scoot that way yep. over? I don't know how to use these trackpads. <laughs> Sorry, it's not my computer. <laughs> and then like make yep. these like really small and that exactly. really big. Yeah, yes, fine. yes, perfect. And then, and then we should just be able to hit the space bar to advance. And then how do I do that on this computer? Just hit the space bar. Oh, like you said. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, with no further ado, I'm going to hit the space bar and see if it works. Aha! It worked! Um, so today I'm going to share my journey in tourism, what I've learned in this business, and ideas that I have for sparking and supporting regenerative tourism in Southeast Alaska. And um, every single example that I'm going to share with you in this talk today, I've either personally been there, and or worked with and or worked for and or learned from and or consulted for. So this is the order. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got into it. I want to bring up the debate, tourism, is it good or bad? Um, and then I want to share lots of examples from indigenous tourism and how to apply these learnings to Southeast Alaska. And then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So I want to start by telling you, oh, and also as a side note, I used to speak like a normal person, but then I moved to Southern California where everybody talks like this all the time. So <laughs> I, I tend to lecture like I'm running a YouTube channel. So please bear with me. I'll try not to go too fast, but it took me 20 years to learn to talk real fast and now I need to unlearn it. But um, I wanna start by telling you who I am and why I'm so interested in tour tourism and cultural bridging. So uh, my background is Alaska Native, Unangan and Yupik from Bristol Bay, South Naknek specifically. I'm also uh, Northwest European, of Northwest European descent, Swedish, and another thread that I'm trying to chase down, and I think I'm really close to figuring out. Um, and my mom, mo uh, my, mo my mother moved to Seattle, her family moved her to Seattle during World War II when, um, around the time the Aleut removal was happening, but the family always kept their houses in Naknek and Cold Bay and Anchorage. Um, so I was born in Seattle, but like many native youth, I was shipped off to family up in Alaska every summer. So spent a lot of time growing up here. And when I was five, my mom moved to Hawaii where she got her master's degree in public health of, at U of H Manoa. And I really enjoyed that time. I was there from about five to seven and a half. And while I was there, I was quickly adopted as Hapa. I went bare feet to school every day. Um, I learned to speak pigeon fluently with my Hawaiian and Okinawan friends. And this image here is just one when we were on a trip back from Hawaii while she was going to school. Um, and as you can see, I made myself a lay from the... Um, from the hibiscus that was in our yard in Seattle, and we're at the downtown Seattle waterfront. Some of you may know this totem pole, and so it's like it's a whole mixed up melange. So I feel like that's my whole life, just cultural crossing and learning to code switch across all of these boundaries. So um, I already told you that I came back uh, to the Juneau area to do research in contemporary Northwest Coast art as an undergraduate. And after I graduated from college, I came back here and I worked for um, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. And I remember at the time, and this is just a promotional photo for, I don't even remember what it was, but um, some of you probably know Ben Cornell and his amazing regalia. And, um, and I worked actually in the language revitalization projects at the university, among other things. Um, but I, one thing I just wanted to mention about this formative time working for SHI is that at the time, Rosita Whirl had a dream to build a cultural center in Juneau, and I'm so excited that it's here. Just incredible. Um, and then I left SHI to get more back to my roots, and I worked at the Alaska Native Heritage Center as the first program supervisor. And that summer, we brought together elders and youth apprentices to build traditional watercraft from all dif the different major regions of Alaska. And I really loved that job, but as I was applying for grants to support the work we did at the Heritage Center, I realized that every time I wrote something to the federal government, it got so twisted up filling out their forms that it actually 
kind of bastardized the mandates that our uh, native board had told us to do. So I decided I better get some more letters behind my name so that I could change policy and have a more of an impact on our issues. So I went to graduate school at UCLA. I went, I went, I either wanted to get an MBA or go to anthropology, but I went into anthropology because it sounded more fun and I wanted to keep working in tourism and exploring the native tourism sector. And I actually, if you read my book, I actually wanted to go learn about uh, indigenous tourism in Polynesia, but my advisors were biased and they told me I had to be an Alaska expert, which is really interesting because if you're non-native or not ethnic or unmarked white in some kind of way, you get to study wherever you want in the world. But anyway, they told me I had to come back to Alaska, so I picked my favorite town in Alaska and asked, got permission to work uh, for Sitka Tribe of Alaska, and I worked for tribal tours for two years. And I really wanted to learn every single aspect of tourism there was. So I started from selling tickets on the dock, to getting my commercial driver's license, to giving tours, to doing hiking tours. I just did as much as I could, and I, I really appreciate learning from Camille Ferguson, who some of you may know. I wrote a book about it, then I wrote another book about it, I brought them, they're here. You can read them, you can take a look at them afterwards. Oh, this one is for the library, by the way. And I'd give you this one too, but it's not even my own copy. I don't even have my own copy of my own book. <laughs> it's kind of sad, because <laughs> I keep giving them away. So after my, post, after my PhD, I got a series of postdoctoral issues, and I was at UC Berkeley for one of them, where I did comparative research examining the issues that native tourism providers around the world face, trying to understand if there were commonalities to it, and um, I went to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and worked with a lot of Maori tourism there, so you'll see a lot of examples of that in this talk. And this is just an image with the tourist studies, tourism studies working group at UC Berkeley, and we were with a delegation from Tajikistan, and I still want to go there and help them because they had some good questions about tourism. And subsequently, I've been consulting in indigenous tourism uh, in many different parts of the world. So now I want to move on to the next section, tourism, good or bad. So I want you to take a second, look at this picture, and think about how it makes you really feel. And what's bubbling up for you. Now, it's kind of sweet. I had the, there is a woman who is the world's best cab driver and she lives in Juneau and I had her last night. I can give you her card after this. And I asked her how, how it made her feel and she said something really beautiful because I was here two weeks ago and there were still cruise ships here and now it's totally different as it is when the season ends. And she said, she said, tourism just breathes life into this town. And I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment. Um, but for myself, I feel very ambivalent about cruise ships. Um, would I be a guest lecturer for a free trip? Probably. <laughs> Do I like that cruise lines pit Southeast Alaska towns against each other to avoid paying head taxes for infrastructure that all the tourists use? No. Do I like the money they bring to port? Yes. Do I like the sewage they dump in the ocean? No. Do I like that they... Um, underpay people from third world countries? No. Uh, do I like that they have their own businesses in town to leak money away from here? Uh, no. Do I like that they don't pay their taxes? No. <laughs> but do I like, do I like the, the tourists they bring? Yes, if I'm their guide. I always love my tourists and visiting people. If I can't walk down the street to get to the post office, not so much. It's a very mixed bag, right? And it's not, I'm not talking all cruise lines. There's some really good ones here in Southeast, but some of them really need to clean up their act. But in many ways, tourism is a really wonderful industry. Um, I love that it brings people together from all different walks of life, face to face. And um, I think that if people can meet each other ac across cultural, ethnic, religious divides, it's actually a catalyst for world peace. I really love that tourism diversifies economies in places that need it. Um, for example, um, tourism played a really great role diversifying the, diversifying the economy in Sitka after the pulp mill closed. 
And I want to share another really good example of this as well. So this is Whale Watch Kaikoura. It's a multi-million dollar enterprise in the South Island of New Zealand. And this was uh, founded in 1987 by uh, Maori Natukuri tribal leaders as a small farming town's economy. It was like a sleepy farming and fishing town, but their economy was really bad. There was rampant unemployment and rampant poverty, especially among the tribal members. And it was kind of like a, one of those like towns where there's one post office and one small grocery store that has everything, not unlike many Alaska towns. And it's also a really great example of how indigenous thinking can lead the way out of the box tourism ideas. So these Natikuri leaders, they knew that their ancestor Paikia, who's seen Whale Rider? Who knows about Paikia? Okay, half the people here. So their ancestor Paikia came to Aotearoa on the back of, on the back of a whale. And they knew that whales would help Paikia's descendants, them. So they mortgaged their properties to start a business with a vessel so that they could take people to see sperm whales because this is one of the best places in the world to see sperm whales. And they just started with uh, one small inflatable boat and even in that first year they had 8,000 passengers. And since then the fleet had expanded to more than four vessels that hold 86 to 116 passengers each and more than 100,000 people come specifically to Kaikoura just to see the sperm whales. Who here has seen a sperm whale before? Two people, aren't they awesome? They're incredible. You did Kaikoura? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. But here's the really exciting part to me. So as Whale Watch Kaikoura started to expand, the whole community began to flourish not just the Maori Pacific Islander community, but also the non-natives. So in addition to providing locals with very badly needed employment, a new marina was built to accommodate these vessels, uh, restaurants, cafes, galleries, accommodations, and other tourism-related services were born. So it really created a whole new economy in this town. But the important thing to point out is that it was all done very thoughtfully following Maori values for stewardship of the land and sea. So they were very strict in making sure that Whale Watch Kaikoura followed specific guidelines for things like emissions, um, not polluting. And as the town grew around tourism and ecotourism, um, the town officials determined that they were gonna become a net carbon zero city. And I believe they were the first, among the first, if not the first net carbon zero city in the world. And it all came out of those Maori values that started with Whale Watch Kaikoura. So on the flip side, tourism also embodies some of the worst of capitalism. So there's rampant exploitation of labor to uh, maximize, maximize profits in the hands of a few, of course. And um, for indigenous and just peoples all over the world, tourism can reduce people to just stereotypes. So the extreme version of this is what's called um, academically, is a very technical term, Disneylandification. <laughs> and uh, this is where living places are turned into playgrounds for mass consumption. And it means the literal transformation of living peoples into cartoonish, stereotypical displays of them, just like the Disney Small World Ride at Disneyland. Excuse me, Get a sip of water. And it reduces people and ethnic groups into stereotypes. And stereotypes, stereotyping is really the tool of othering and dehumanizing people, which is the number one military tactic for killing. The less we think somebody is human, the easier we can kill them. So the Polynesian Cultural Center in Hawaii, now, I'm going, and now I like this interactive thing. Who's been to the PCC? So we, we do the same trips. <laughs> so the Polynesian Cultural Center in Hawaii is a kind of a hybrid example of what I'm talking about. So you can visit all of Polynesia in one place, and these villages, which are small rebuilt architectural structures, they represent all the major Polynesian cultures. And each villi village site is inhabited by tribal members of the culture on display according to the tourists' expectations. So they wear 
traditional clothes, they perform activities associated with their cultures, and they share like very simplified, some would say Disneylandified, information about their culture to visitors. The experience is really neatly packaged, it's not controversial, um, and it's this predictability that each culture can be viewed the same way over and over um, that really appeals to the middlemen in mass tourism. And the workers also don't fully present the truth of their history. They don't really talk about problems associated with colonization or intergenerational trauma. And another thing that what many people don't know about the PCC, you would think it's just the Polynesian Cultural Center. It actually was started by the Mormon Church to help um, Polynesian students at BYU Hawaii to pay for their own education. So it's got a little bit of an interesting history behind it. And there's an even more interesting history behind cultural centers like these, like PCC. They're actually modeled after this open air folk museum called Sconson that was started in 1891 by a man named Arthur Hazilius in Sweden. And the idea behind creating this center, so it was like these little villages, you could get a snapshot of historical life in Sweden and um, people dress in period clothes and do kind of stereotypical things. The whole idea behind Wisconsin, it's called a folk, it's called a folk model center, uh, these folk museums. The whole idea behind it was to create a sense of nationality among Swedish people who visited this space. And so I'm sure in your own mind's eye, if you travel, you can imagine lots of other cultural centers that kind of follow this model of these little villages, people dressing in period, talking about how they would have done things culturally. And the Alaskan, okay, who's been to the Alaska Native Heritage Center? I know my friends over there have been there. <laughs> Um, I love the, uh, the Alaska Native Heritage Center. It does follow that similar model to bridge cultures between natives and non-natives, but unlike the Polynesian Cultural Center, it was created out of a mandate of elders at AFN and it always had a native board. And when it's not just hosting visitors, it has year-round activities for the native, the greater native community. Another good example of this in, uh, this kind of a model in Southeast, it's very classic in my mind, is Saxman Village. So the point I'm making is that without prior tourism business experience, tourism proprietors tend to repeat what's familiar and what they've seen before. Um, so here's, a, an, an exam here's an image of members of the Ala American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association visiting Okunalufti, North Carolina, which is the Eastern Band of Cherokees uh, tourism. Uh, it's, I think it's the first Native American tourism center in all of North America. It's very old and it very much follows that folk model. Um, it is a cool place to visit. I'm not necessarily criticizing that model, but now, indigenous tourism proprietors, we've now had over 20 years experience innovating this space so that we can move beyond the quasi Disneylandified excursion. So now I'm gonna go into the next section in this talk, which is what can we learn from indigenous tourism, especially in terms of regenerative tourism and the lessons that can be passed on to Southeast. So I wanna start with a type of tourism that I think of as family tourism. So this is a place called Big Hogan. It's on the eastern rim of the Grand Canyon, and that's Alberta Henry there. And Alberta used to work at the Peabody Coal Mine, and where she lives in Arizona is very rural. And there weren't very many jobs, and the only jobs that uh, a lot of Navajos could get was working for this extractive coal mining industry and also the uranium mining when that was there. They didn't want to, and they had to move from their homelands. They were stewarding. They didn't want to work there, but they had to make money and there was limited jobs. So they almost were forced to participate in jobs that undermine their traditional ways of life. These extractive industries have sucked up the aquifers, which made it um, so that there was no water for their traditional farming or for their sheep to drink and it was a bad situation. So Alberta got an idea, her family land, very close to the Eastern Rim of the Grand Canyon. She, millions of people go to the Western Rim, and it's very crowded if you've ever been there, and very commoditized. And she had her family land, and she 
did her research and found out that there were more, there were about 900,000 cars a year that went, came by her way. So she started Big Hogan with just a tent, basically, on her family land. And she came to uh, create Hogan's. Hogan's are the traditional Navajo style house. And she made it like glamping. And now she has visitors. She was able to quit her job and she was able to employ her family in every business. And more importantly, they were able to share their culture, live at home and not be forced to participate in extraction, which is very regenerative. And another cool thing about Big Hogan, this is a terrible picture. I, I think it was blacked out on purpose. Um, I couldn't find my personal photo of it. But Big Hogan has one of the most amazing rock art sites I've ever seen. Like this could be like a UNESCO heritage site. And the Navajo, they don't tell people about their private petroglyph sites because they get vandalized, basically. And it's an amazing perk of going and staying at Big Hogan and going to the Grand Canyon from the Eastern Rim, which is um, just as pretty and less crowded than the Western Rim. So another family business with petroglyphs is this place called Knot Knot up the Murray River in Southern Australia. And it is the oldest rock art site in all of Australia. And as with many rock art sites and petroglyphs, there has been violence and vandalism associated with. Um, in addition to that, this is a place where New Agers have some kind of belief around cosmology that the petroglyphs or that rock art shows, and they would they hold these new agey ceremonies that were very offensive to the Aboriginal people that stewarded this. So the um, Manumbatan of Ab Aborigines, who steward this site, they partnered up with the uh, South Australia State Department of Parks, and they said, "Well, let us interpret this. Let us steward this site." So they worked with uh, archeologists at Flinders University and they created appropriate interpretation. They made the site protected and it's their family. So when you go visit this site, they, the family loves to be there because this is the place where they've had stories since time immemorial, since before what's incorrectly called the dream time. And they, but the cool thing is they talk about growing up with it now in the contemporary in addition to the stories way back. And it's, it's an absolutely beautiful place to visit. And now, so Not Not is open for domestic and foreign tourists, but who they really host is um, school buses full of kids. The school buses just come in, students come, and it, it pays their bills. And the cool thing about that is that the students learn about Australia's earliest history from the people who truly know it. And they are, they do have national pride around it, but from an Aboriginal perspective. And I feel like that is a way to, um, to support a stewardship mindset among Australians of every different background, settler or indigenous, and also respect across the cultures. So here's another example of family tourism. So this is, uh, have you guys been to this one? My friends over there who did the whale watching. <laughs> Have you done Maori tours, Kaitakora? No. You <laughs> so you know Maurice. <laughs> okay, well you can help me after the Q&A. You, you can come up and help me with the Q&A. So Maori Tours Kaikoura was started by Maurice uh, Manawatu and his wife. And this is that town with the whale watching that spurned an entire tourism industry. And this is another example of family tourism. It's one of the, I think, hey, my friends over there. <laughs> I think it's one of the most fun tours I've ever been on. And I've been on so many, right? It's like hands down awesome. So this tour, I'll describe it to you, and yours might have been different, but you start out, you, they just have a van. They just have their lives, their culture, and their van. They don't need to build anything. And so they take you, you walk on the beach, you learn about the cultural landscape, the stories associated with the mountains, you learn about the Kaimoana, the food in the ocean. Uh, and then you go take a walk in the woods and they tell you about the forest and some stories. And then they hand you a piece of paper and teach you, you all have to sing a song. So that's the moment I captured there. And, um, and the Maori culture is very rich with singing. They love to sing. And so, you get to feel a part of it. And then before the day is over, 
he takes you to his, um, his mother's house or his grandma's house or his auntie's house or something, and you go sit down and have British-style tea with them and just shoot the shit. And, like, it's just literally how they live, and it's the coolest tour that's won so many awards. So we don't have to build all these purpose-built things. We can just be who we are and have family-based tours that are small-scale. So here's another hiking tour called Footprints Waipua in Hokianga, New Zealand. And this tour, um, it's again um, a Maori uh, hapu, um, similar to what's referred to as a clan here. They uh, got a concession from the Department of Forestry or National Parks, whatever it was, to do tours here in the Kauri tree forest. And these are the largest trees of New Zealand. And they interpret it from a Maori perspective. And um, the reason I wanted to bring this up, and when I was working for tribal tours, I used to, for some reason, nobody else wanted to do the hiking tours. So I, got, I asked for them, and I got them all. And I loved going on hiking tours with our visitors because they were longer. We had more intimate connections with each other. And also, I could interpret the plants um, as I had learned. And I feel like there's far too few hiking tours in Southeast Alaska, and especially ones that really interpret. And one time, one of the most special things I ever did is um, there was an elder in Sitka, Jesse Johnny, and I, there was about 25, 30 physicians from the lower 48, and they asked for a medicinal plant tour, and I was the bus driver. So I just drove them around and um, you know, helped out our elder, Jesse, it was supposed to be a hiking tour, but the entire two and a half hours, we didn't walk more than 10 feet on the trail because over, even more than the first hour of it was her just talking about Devil's Club because it's that amazing. And I mean, I was blown away. I wish I could have remembered every word she said. These physicians, they had the time of their lives walking three feet <laughs> into the woods. <laughs> and there's not enough of that. There's, I mean, we don't want to give away intellectual property, especially indigenous intellectual property that we don't have permission to, and I'll get to that later. But the point is, there's a lot of different ways to do hiking tours and outdoor tours. Uh-oh. Now it's not advancing. I'm scared to touch things. Oh, this happened to me before with this slide. It's a, it's a buggy slide. I mean, that particular one. You might have to exit out and like manually press the next one and then come back in. Is that the next one? Yeah. How'd you do that? That was uh, hit 23 oh. and enter. Uh-oh, now I accidentally took it back. Anyways. This is going to look great living in perpetuity online, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so now I want to come back to cultural landscapes and regenerative tourism. So here we are um, looking at, to your left-hand side, um, the Kopi tree on Rikohu Island, um, which is 450 miles from the nearest land mass. And, um, it's been the homeland of the Moriori peoples for hundreds of years. And uh, when the British came here and settled, they cut down most of the Kopi tree forests until there was just only a few sparse stands left and, for sheep farming. And then they established a crayfish fishery. But what they call crayfish is what we call lobster. And um, they really just kind of pillaged the land. Uh, but the Moriori never left. and they had a land claim settlement trust, and they used that money to build a marae, which is like a meeting house. And this marae hosts events around global peacekeeping because the Moriori never believed in war. There are very peaceful peoples. And to go along with that, they built this lodge. So that's me and some of my friends at the lodge. And, and that created some um, extra income and jobs. And then they brought people in to volunteer, community members and people from the outside, to help restore the kopi trees that were being attacked by a nasty fungus. And if you look really closely at that kopi tree, you can see the, um, I don't want to mispronounce it, so let me check my notes. I 
Okay, without checking my notes, I believe it's called uh, oh, Rakao Mamori, which is, uh, it's really important Tonga. It's like really sacred to them. And you can see the little face kind of on that tree. Um, these were carved by their ancestors in the trees and, and they're sacred. And so it's all kind of intertwined. And then they also have kopi tree replantings. So the tribe, they're doing a mix of tourism, events, community center, volunteering, ecological restoration, all to, and it's all together. It's not separate. So another example of tourism as a way to restore ecologies while uplifting the economy is a place called Waimara. Have you guys been to Waimara? Mara? <laughs> Hawks Bay, it's, in Hawks, it's near Hawks Bay. It's, yeah. Waimara Mara, um, it's on a privately owned working farm owned by a Maori tribal group. And this area of New Zealand has very significant Maori and Pacific Islander populations. They have very large families. My friends who live there have more than 10 kids. Um, they also face rampant unemployment and or seasonal employment because of the farming. There's a lot of reliance on welfare. There's a lot of gang activity. And so this um, Maori tribe that owned this working farm, just like what happened on Rakohu, you can see um, here, it would have been completely forested before the British came, completely all dark green, but it was totally deforested for sheep farming and other types of farming. They wanted to restore the land back to the way it was when their ancestors lived there. And they also wanted to create a cultural center and create a place that local Maori and Pacific Islander people could come and gather and heal from intergenerational trauma while hosting tourists. And so this place too is a cruise ship port. So they started to think about how they could restore parts of the farm. And I'm gonna show you a series of pictures of what they did here. If I can get this to move forward. Sorry. I don't know where to find 24, that's my problem. I'm sorry, it's not my computer. I'm too old for this. Oh, that's how you, I could do that. Okay, I just learned something. Um, so here you can see uh, Maori garden sites and also Pa Fortress archaeological sites. And you have to, like, deep in that valley, that's where you, you have to use your mind's eye imagination to imagine a village of, like, two or three hundred people thriving here with their gardens. So um, they named the site Haakina. And they also established a native plant garden to restore the landscape. And they interpret the edible and medicinal uses of the plants as well. Oof, I went too far. <laughs> Should have a clicker. Um, so Hakino is still a working farm, but it's limited. And it's a great example of the transformation of land use to re-indigenize space as well as exemplifying principles of stewardship over traditional lands while inviting visitors in to the space to learn. So not only is it um, restoring these lands, but it's teaching others about it through tourism. And I imagine visitors would get inspired by this to think about what they could do when they get back home to where they live. And so the final component of Hakino that I wanna emphasize is volunteerism. So the Maori Hapa brings in uh, volunteers from their own indigenous communities. And they also bring in volunteers from outside like visitors to build up the space, to work the farm, to not work the farm, to restore the farm and uh, help support what they're doing. And I really like their approach. They have a, there's kind of a pan indigenous concept and I don't wanna be too broad, but it's kind of like a everybody has their own gifts kind of idea. And that's what they do with their volunteerism. They find out what people are good at and they have them do those jobs. And it's really worked out well for them. So last New Zealand tour, I had to share at least one adventure tour. Um, this is Kaitiaki Adventures Rotorua. And my friend was friends with the owners and she said, oh, 
well, let me set you up for this river rafting tour. And I said, okay, where do I show up at 8 a.m.? I thought it was going to be like a lazy river type thing, but it's really the highest commercially navigable waterfall in the world. It's at 10 meters. I don't even, what's that, 30 feet? I don't even know. So <laughs> I got a nod, yeah. Um, and then after that, I did this boogie boarding down a river thing that they call sledging. Really hard to do. I was so high from the adrenaline for the next 24 hours. It was crazy. So at this point, I just want to uh, give a big shout out to Icy Straight Point for their zip line, which I still haven't done. There's a lot more room for adventure in Southeast Alaska. There's one more thing I want to say about Kaitiaki Tours. Their primary market is backpackers. And I don't know how many backpackers we get in Southeast Alaska, but I know there's been a move to attract a lot more independent tourists and excursions that um, are attractive to the independent tourists. So I think some of our uh, off the beaten path adventures, actually one of them with the Path to Prosperity uh, project that Spruce Root has is like a long form kayaking trip that's like six weeks. I know there's people who will wanna do that and pay for it. So speaking of adventure, um, I once had a job learning all about how to support Kunsan speaking tourism in Southern Africa. And I said, if I'm gonna have to go to Southern Africa, I'm for sure gonna go on a safari. So I Googled safaris in the Okavanga Delta and I specifically wanted an indigenous led safari. Could not find anything. All I could find was safaris that were owned by like Dutch and Germans. And then even if you looked into their guides, their guides were they were African, but they were from like tribes from elsewhere that were like farming peoples. They weren't peoples who hunted and gathered or did subsistence. Luckily, I had a friend who had an NGO um, helping elephants in the area and I called her up and I said, is there not one indigenous safari in all of Okavanga Delta? And she said, yes, actually there's one. It recently opened, it's owned by a San um, Community Trust um, in the Marem, it's next to the Maremi Game Reserve and um, it's called Sango. And so I was able to sign up and I had my, and the guides there were incredible. I knew they'd be incredible. We saw the big five animals everyone wants to see on safari, but we also saw tons of animals like leopards, which are notoriously hard to find, which of course, if you have an indigenous guide, whose community has been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years, they're gonna know the tricks for finding the animals much better than some imports from somewhere else. Okay, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna try that trick all by myself now. It worked. And I just wanted to show you my wonderful guide face. And um, not far from the five-star safari camp was, a, um, was their village where they lived. And so in addition to the safari offerings, um, you could also take excursions to go to the village. You could buy local arts and crafts, meet locals, and they were really proud of sharing their homebrew that they made. And I thought that combining wildlife watching with visiting the village was like such an add-on to just the safari part. So I feel like that's something that could have some potential for Southeast Alaska. Like maybe there could be some kind of whale watching with like some kind of home visitor, learn what it's like to live in the village. Of course, in a very controlled, small scale kind of way. So after the safari detour, I took to the Okavanga Delta. Um, most of the work took me to places in the Kalahari Desert. And this is the Kurusan Dance Festival uh, that took place near a village called Dikar. And when I went, I just happened to be there at the right time. And when I went there, it was very, very local. All these San communities from all over Southern Africa came to this uh, festival. And then there was like me and three other white anthropologists in the crowd the whole time. Like it really wasn't a tourist thing. And um, so I just want to say this to point out that festivals are heavily marketed um, in, the Euro in Europe and in the US, not so much in Africa. This was kind of a missed opportunity for them. They actually wanted more outsiders to visit their festivals. And of course, Southeast is well known for celebration and many other festivals and events. 
And of course, we don't want too many people coming in and, and taking the spots locals could take, but I feel like there's an opportunity for some of these smaller festivals and events that maybe are in off season to attract more of those independents. And I think it would be kind of a win-win. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. This is just an adorable picture of preschoolers. Aren't they cute? And not far from the grounds of the festival was another San tourism camp. <laughs> this one was a little bit Disneylandified to meet tourist expectations. Um, as you can see, this elder here is dressed in traditional clothing that they don't actually wear. And I talked to him about it, and then he admitted to me that um, the village where they were living, or they were living, was actually just made for the tourists. But what I want to emphasize about what I loved about this particular tour is that we learned about um, subsistence. So our guide showed us how to find water in the middle of the desert. At the beginning of the tour, he set a bird snare, like a little simple bird snare. He had the little boy set it down. And then he showed us how to pick these acacia berries and just talked about the traditional lifestyle. And by the time we were done walking around the whole area, we came back to the snare, we caught a bird, and then we cooked it and ate it over the fire. It was so awesome. There's no reason we couldn't do something like that that's subsistence-based in a sustainable and re re and regenerative way in Southeast. Again, it couldn't be mass tourism, but that's what people want to do. They want to go, of course we know people want to catch a fish here, but there's other things people can do as well. Okay, so now we're back in Alaska. So when I was a professor, I hosted a field school at the Littlefields Fish Camp outside of Sitka. And this group of college students, not unlike the last tour I showed you, they learned about the subsistence lifestyle, um, stewardship of the land, they experienced cultural arts and storytelling, and I also had them intern with the tribe, and they did all this but while earning quite a lot of college credits, and they paid for it, and it was actually profitable for the university. And it also supported the culture camp and the little fields, and it also supported younger children coming to the culture camp. So I'm just gonna show you a few pictures. Here we are making twine. We went beach staining. Why did I think it was good to streak my hair like that? <laughs> that looks awful, what was I thinking? <laughs> After we did the beach stain, we smoked fish for the community. So in addition to educational tourism, this was almost kind of a form of volunteerism or community support tourism because we gave um, so many jars of fish to the elders. So I want to end this section on tours. We're almost done here into Q&A. <clears throat> on a note of this idea of changing nothing about what you do as a tourism strategy. We don't have to meet what we perceive the cruise ships want people to provide or what we perceive the tourists want. They just want to experience how we live. So I, from time to time I make cultural immersion tours. And this is one I designed for people who really wanted a deep dive into learning about the Navajo and Hopi people. And so instead of taking them to like museums and stuff, I just called up Navajos and Hopis that I know. And this Rosemary Williams, she has a, she lives on the farm that her family has um, grown beans, corn, squash, and melons on for so many generations they can't even remember. They have um, so many heirloom seeds. And I say, Rosemary, can I just bring 12 people over, you know, next Tuesday for about two and a half hours? And can you just share with them what you do? How, how do you do your dry farming techniques? And um, this is a little biased, but in, in my experience, indigenous peoples are really, really good at hosting. So you don't really need to train people in hosting skills. I mean, Alaska hosts, that's designed to train people to fit a certain standard that appeals to the cruise ship wanting their regularity, standard thing every time. But you don't have to train elders in how to host. You're just like, hey, I'm coming over. And so um, we go over there. I've done this a few times with Rosemary. And I always try to pay elders about $500 an hour because they're, they have more expertise in my mind than like doctors and um, lawyers, so they should get paid that wage. And um, 
And she talks about growing up there, how her grandfather made her and her cousins wake up, face the east, and run and yell. That's a Navajo tradition. And then she used to run in the washes and how strict it was and how she learned to be a farmer. And she'll sometimes tell stories about how Monsanto came sneaking around trying to buy her heirloom seeds. And sometimes her family members will stop by and you'll get to meet them, but you always get to taste something. And these are hands down the most delicious melons I have ever, I still remember those melons, they're so good. And you cannot get these in the store. These are a very special Navajo variety of melons. Um, so another similar, just share how you live kind of tour, I took last summer um, about 100 and, I don't know what it was, like 100 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in uh, Sweden. And this tour was to go visit the um, reindeer calving grounds of the Sami people. And we just got in a van. It was me and another couple. They took us to the place where they keep the reindeer before they run them up the mountains in the winter. And, to, and we just saw the reindeer and the baby reindeer. And the guide just started working. Like he started repairing fences and puttering around and um, patching up holes and things. And he just left us there for like an hour. <laughs> and it was like peace and solitude hanging out with reindeer and baby reindeer. You know, we're often taught that we have to constantly interpret and talk to people when we're giving a tour or hosting, but you can just let people be. And um, you might, some of you might have heard the stereotype that Swedish people aren't very talkative. And it's even like more so for the Sami. It's like a cultural thing. People just, it's kind of like actually Western Alaska. You know, we're, you're taught not to be this gregarious or talk this fast. Um, so our guide was very taciturn and said nothing. And then after about an hour, I started following him around and asking him some questions and we kind of started to get along. And so then they took us into a tent and that's the next slide. And they lit a fire, and this is the exact type of tent they still have for the reindeer husbandry in the summertime. And they just cooked some fresh reindeer meat, very simple on a pan. It was so good. And then our guide, <coughs> Simon, I think it's because I made friends with him. He yoiked for us, which is the Sami um, singing, traditional singing they do. And then he invited me to come visit his family <laughs> in their village. And I happened to be going to their village the next day. So and that was like another... 100 kilometers north, way up there in the Arctic. And um, it was just beautiful. And it just taught me that as a visitor, you can have an incredible, immersive cultural experience without being talked at or tour guided around. Just literally being in the space is enough. Why can't we have things like that in Southeast Alaska? People love it. So, um, oh, I was going to take this slide out. But as far as these come as you are type of tourism, <coughs> My startup, Waka, um, it's designed to address this problem where people can't find indigenous tours and indigenous tourism providers can't market. So I won't beleaguer this. You can ask more questions about it later because it's a little bit off topic. But um, we are hoping to pilot in southeast Alaska. So what have we seen so far? I'm going to have to read this. Cultural centers the built environment, animal watching, wildlife tourism, cultural landscapes, family tourism, eco-restoration, volunteerism, farming, adventures, events, educational tourism, and my favorite, be who you are tourism. So it looks like this has been about an hour, so I'm gonna gloss through the next few slides so we can get straight to Q&A. I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, if you are a tourism provider thinking of getting in it, a couple of what I'm calling go zones in developing excursions. Um, obviously, you want to demonstrate your values. That's especially important in regenerative tourism. Um, <clears throat> honor your guests as guests. We don't have to pander to them. Uh, acknowledge the past, present, and future. Share worldviews. Um, determine what intellectual property to keep from commodification and agree on protocols for tourism. So I will let this come up naturally if it's a Q&A, but I know one of the big questions out there in Southeast, 
especially for non-natives in this business, is how do we incorporate the Tlingit, Haida, or Simchian cultures depending on where they are? And it's not necessarily a black or white issue. Um, <clears throat> obviously, ignoring intellectual property issues is a problem. So by intellectual property, I mean things like at u, things like that. Um, we don't want to water down cultures. You don't want to be a place where you just present like a, a one small side of things. One of the things that I always loved about working at the Heritage Center and Tribal Tours is our bosses always said to us, you know, they wanted us to present the iconic aspects of Alaska Native cultures, but they also told us not to shy away from the true history of what happened, not water it down. Part of what we do is educate people. <clears throat> And then we don't want to disrespect the cultural values of each other. Excuse me. <coughs> I forgot how to use my diaphragm <laughs> to the drama lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm throat talking. <laughs> um, so I want to start with a few responsibilities and ethics. Um, it's important to these are just a few things I want to end on to reflect on. It's important to be a steward of knowledge. Know, have permission to share knowledge. Know whose knowledge it is um, and get it right, um, especially in terms of native cultures. You got to check in with elders, not just in the beginning, but all the way along constantly. That's what I've always done. We have responsibilities, not forget our responsibilities to the next generation. Grow at the pace of sustainability or regeneration. Um, the problem with here, Juno, is that it grew too fast without thinking. And so now Juno's got a problem with infrastructure, head taxes, businesses being owned by outsiders. I was really, really happy walking downtown today seeing so many businesses that scream, locally owned. It didn't used to be like that, but it's a problem. Obviously, you all know that. And to set an example. So um, the, this is the second to last slide, I promise. Um, these are the opportunity spaces I see for Southeast Alaska. Um, maybe a larger one might be to think more about events and festivals. Kind of in the medium term, um, there's a huge space for education. There's a glaring space for educational tourism here. Um, if you look at the statistics on educational tourism, like the organization called People to People, um, it's like a billion dollar industry globally. And it's really regenerative and it's different. It's just different than cruise ship tourism. Uh, unique lodging, I did not, I do have a series of slides on unique lodging, but I just didn't have the space to put it in. And volunteerism. I feel like there's a huge space for volunteerism. I have a friend who has a volunteerism, his uh, it's a volunteerism platform, and they literally just have a subscription model for forty nine dollars a year. And people who want to backpack and not pay that much money, it's like woofing. I guess if you've heard of woofing, they can find opportunities all around the world to volunteer and go to new places. I could see that really blowing up here in Southeast. And then in terms of small scale, um, there's a lot of, op I know there's a lot of guides out there, but there's a lot more opportunities for safaris and small scale guiding on the terms that people want. And what I've been talking about, the just be yourself tourism. So now we're at questions. We can, um, we can just kill, if I, if I shut the clamshell, will it kill the, well, I don't need, I don't need a slide up. Hi. Hi, thank you. I'm really excited about regenerative tourism, so I was great, happy to see that we're, we're having this here today. Um, I have a whole list of questions, because I've been involved with and studying tourism for 40 years, and I guess to sort of put it in, um, where Juno is now and where we are now. I'm sure that you're familiar with the Butler's life cycle model of tourism. For those who aren't, basically the initial tourism is generally the really experiential tourism that you're describing. And then as it develops, more built, more other people come in until you get to the Disneyfication point 
at which the main attractions are built attractions, which to me is largely where Juno is becoming um, now. And typically after that, there's a rapid decline in the quality of the tourist and the value that the, that the tourists place on the community. They're coming to a Disneyland instead of an authentic place. So how do we, given the reality that we are where we are, how do we reset it? I see the cruise tourism as hugely displacing of all the wonderful types of tourism you save for Juneau. Um, until we deal with cruise, I don't see that we can really accommodate the rest. And then the one other piece would be the tragedy of the commons and how, like your example in New Zealand, that once they start developing something, if you look at the whale watching fleet, when you were in Juneau in the 1980s, we didn't have whale watching as a tour. It, it didn't exist. What I remember from the 1980s is like one or two cruise lines coming in a week and everybody I knew was griping about the pollution in the air and the pollution, it was, people were mad. Right, well we had a lot more cruise ships than that. We had up to six or eight a day, but they were the little ones that you pictured instead of the massive ones that we have now. Yeah, they were smaller. They were a lot smaller. Um, but just the tragedy of commons, how, you, how the people that you've well, worked with have dealt with that. Thank you, it's a lot. Um, I don't know that anybody's particularly solved that in my observation. And um, it's a moral imperative. We're going into the sixth mass distinction in the world's history, and it's our fault. So at some point, it's gonna have to collapse on its own or we're gonna have to do something about it. And that's a policy issue. And people are going to be against it, especially with the politics in this state. But at some point, it's going to end. And, you know, I don't even remember who it was, but <clears throat> there's elders around here who say, we were here before the Russians, we're here after the Russians, we were here before the Americans, we'll be here after the Americans. People seem to think that the world that we're living in now is static and it's all it's ever going to be, but this country's only what, 250 years old? It's not gonna be around much longer. And neither is tourism, cruise ship tourism. So I, how do you deal with it? I don't know, I'm looking at it from a, like a very long generational view. Um, people used to think that nobody, not everybody would drive automobiles, but then it happened overnight. There's, there's a book about it, I can't remember the title. But I think that um, like what I would suggest is, uh, that we come up with all of these, not alternative models, but new models, and see how they work. And maybe that would spurn a different kind of grassroots movement around these bigger issues that you're asking about. Any others? Wasn't there someone over there raising their hand at some point? Oh, um. Hi, <laughs> I have a question about like, so you talked a lot about like um, tourism in the sense of like, gosh, I can't think right now. We, we, I, I'm looking at it from like a point of like, not necessarily like how you view it as like an ecological standpoint and how do you apply this, what you talked about tonight, but also being like environmentally conscious. And like, I mean, I, I think it is obviously a lot more environmentally conscious, but like, what are like good habits to do when it comes to that? For tourism enterprises? Well, I think I had a lot of examples of them like building in um, like carbon neutrality into your business model is one, uh, restoring landscapes and helping them to be regenerative, teaching visitors how they can do that at home and why it's important. And maybe even because it is so beautiful here, people will be inspired to imagine other places they live that are more degraded as a more beautiful, rich landscape. Those are just three. 
We have a question online. Well, there's a couple comments and questions. Okay, so Jim Powell uh, says, Alexis, I am a PI for two NSF research projects dealing with cruise ship impacts on communities in Southeast Alaska and then five communities in the Arctic. I am very interested in your perspectives. <laughs> I, I will text him my contact. <laughs> information. Um, yeah, I actually had um, a consulting client where I was supporting tourism, Inuit tourism startups in the um, northeast Canada, like north of Hudson Bay. And what I've heard lately is that it is developing at a pace that outstrips what the communities will be ready for and it's not being done thoughtfully, but, um, oh gosh, I'll, I'll share my contact information with you. Because that was kind of a statement and a, and a really big one. And we have a comment from Ishmael Hope, who said, excellent presentation. I appreciate the sense of ethics and working closely with native indigenous peoples. And I like the sense of people bonding with others simply visiting, creating connections. Thanks, Ishmael. Hi. I don't know where the camera is. And then the uh, Leahy Foundation uh, has kind of a couple comments here. Um, I'll give them to you all at once and repeat them if you need. Uh, so they started with uh, just, in quotes, uh, implies fairness to all people plus species. Cruise ship tourism at scale we experience in Southeast Alaska consumes a large amount of fossil fuel on ships plus shoreside. How transition to, quote, regenerative? And then they say, if Juno is beyond, quote, carrying capacity, how do we scale back, revert, and pay debt service on docks, legally limit tax slash ear. Um, and then they ask to please define regenerative and to elaborate on that. Well, actually for that comment and the other one of the PI, um, if you wanna know my thoughts on cruise line tourism, Read my book. <laughs> it's a little, it was, I mean, it's based on information from before, but not much has changed, except things have probably gotten worse. So I've got some details and thoughts in there. And, um, you know, I'm not the expert in how to reverse mass tourism. I just know what I know. But I think it all has to do with grassroots movements to elect people who will stop kowtowing into the cruise line interests that may not be in the best interests of everyday residents. And I'm not saying that cruise ships are wholly bad. Um, it's not, it's, there is definitely gray area, but there's ways to address it so that it's better. And uh, regenerative, um, it, so we used to talk about sustainability and if you think about what sustainability is, that means you're just sustaining what you already have. But if your landscape, your cultural, biological landscape that you live in is degraded for some reason, you're sustaining it to be like that. So when we think regenerative, that means that it's something that can regenerate something that's been damaged, that allows nature to flourish on its own and have the right to evolve and be biodiverse. So that is your goal, not staining, sustaining, but also regenerating. Give me a question over here, anything. 
this was fascinating. And I want to thank you very much for coming to UAS to do this presentation. And Karen, mm -hmm. I want you to get to work on this. <laughs> And to follow up on, on her comment, uh, would you consider uh, writing a textbook for re so we could teach regenerative tourism here? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Somebody had to ask. <laughs> Please. Okay, that's a good segue. So I have this book okay. <laughs> about working as a native tour guide. And then I have this second book, which I'm giving to the library. I don't know who to give it to. Um, it's about indigenous tourism movements. It's a edited volume about um, using movement as a metaphor about how indigenous tourism isn't just, most of the books out there, they, the textbooks out there, they're actually just like business books that don't delve into the um, social and political and environmental implications. But this book does from a critical lens. Required reading for our classes. And then, I'm going to segue because people have been here a long time. I just brought my other books, so uh, you can you don't have to keep live streaming this unless you yeah keep live streaming it. <laughs> so this book just came out like eight weeks ago. It's called Kipunamuk, We Actually Moon's Thanksgiving Story. I now write children's books, and um, it's about Thanksgiving from a native perspective. Our lead writer, uh, the both other writers are dear friends of mine. Our lead writer is Wampanoag, and it talks about we really had a problem with the way children learn about Thanksgiving because it sets up us, them dichotomies and it's the first time native kids really see themselves, um, you know, in a kind of a bad light through stereotypes and it, um, the way Thanksgiving is taught, it really, um, it really idealizes the ideologies behind white supremacy. Like it's all centering the pilgrims and then the natives come and help. Like we, it automatically sets native kids up to feel lesser than. So we wanted to address that. And we also wanted to help non-native kids to learn a better story. So instead of this up, us them pilgrim Indians story, we, ta we talked about Thanksgiving from the perspective of Weachamun, which is corn and Wampanoag. So you're welcome to look at this afterwards. And then this is a super, super sneak peek. It's like a pre, it's been published of my next book. It's called What Your Ribbon Skirt Means to Me, uh, Deb Holland's Historic Inauguration. And in this story, um, I really wanted to set a story that showcased um, an urban Indian population because, um, you know, if natives are erased throughout the US, the most, most erased natives are urban Indian youth, in my perspective. So, um, so it takes place in a fictional West Coast <laughs> urban Indian center, uh, making ribbon skirts, which is something I, I have definitely done in uh, the centers in San Francisco, the, in Oakland, and um, gone to lots of these events in Seattle as well. So I wanted to give those kids, those kids, let them see themselves in a book that celebrates them. And so you guys are welcome to, if we're done with Q&A, you're welcome to look at any of these. And I just wanted to share my children's books because I'm happy about them. Thank you so much.